first great flyers were not birds. They took to the sky 60 million years before the first known bird. And then they vanished, leaving scant clues about how they lived. These were the pterosaurs, also known as the pterodactyls. These flying reptiles were cousins of the dinosaurs. 65 million years after the last pterosaur disappeared, scientists ask, how did reptiles learn to fly? On the shores of the Niobrara Sea, 85 million years ago, a young pterosaur stretches its wings for its first flight. With a wingspan of nearly 20 feet, it scans for its first prey beneath the blue waters. In the still waters of the Niobrara Sea, carcasses drifted to the bottom and were fossilized, undisturbed by currents. Today, all that remains of the Niobrara Sea is a dusty limestone chalk bed that runs from North Dakota to New Mexico. It is one of the few places in America where the fossils of pterodactyls are found. Like the dinosaurs, pterodactyls were reptiles, more akin to lizards than birds. Yet like birds, pterodactyls could fly. Among the last of these flying reptiles was Pteranodon. Paleontologist Chris Bennett has spent thousands of hours prospecting for pterosaur fossils in the Niobrara chalk beds in western Kansas. 85 million years ago, this would have been at the bottom of a, a sea. It would be about uh, 200 meters deep, and it ran from the Arctic Ocean down to the Gulf of Mexico, and uh, the near shore was about 200 kilometers from here. Uh, the sea would be full of uh, large uh, mosasaurs, seagoing lizards, turtles, plesiosaurs, uh, all sorts of fish, and above would be flying pteranodon. A typical day in the life of Pteranodon would be flying out over the, this Niobrara Seaway, um, soaring on the wind, um, flapping occasionally in order to uh, gain altitude and so forth, but mostly soaring on the wind just as a lot of modern seabirds and large birds do today. Um, they'd be chasing after schools of fish to feed and probably would be spending most of their time uh, feeding. At night, they probably would just rest on the, the surface of the sea as uh, living albatrosses do today. And, over the past 125 years, 1,100 fossils of Pteranodon have been unearthed here. In the autumn of 1870, the area was explored by eminent Yale paleontologist O.C. Marsh and his Wild West-style hunting party, toting guns and bowie knives. In the pioneer days of paleontology, the photos made good souvenirs to send to the folks back east. So, too, did the fossils of Pteranodon. Marsh's discovery of Pteranodon opened a new chapter in the history of pterosaurs. Pterosaurs were not dinosaurs. As far as paleontologists can determine, pterosaurs descended from small, lightweight, four-legged reptiles that lived about 250 million years ago. By 225 million years ago, the pterosaurs were accomplished flyers. The pterosaurs came in two evolutionary waves. The first of them were called rhamphorhynchoids, meaning pointy, curved nose. Their fossils revealed they were only about the size of pigeons. The rhamphorhynchoids had long, skinny heads filled with teeth probably used for plucking fish out of the water. These early pterosaurs had long, stabilizing tails, like the tail on a kite. 
The definitive evolutionary feature was a super pinky. The fourth finger on each hand had become longer than their entire bodies and supported a wing. The other fingers, normal sized, developed claws. The first ramphorhynchoids date back more than 200 million years. By 150 million years ago, they had evolved in great variety and covered the globe. The fossil record of the ramphorhynchoids spans almost 50 million years from 230 to 180 million years ago. For unknown reasons, by 180 million years ago, the ramphorhynchoids vanished. A second stage of pterosaur, the pterodactyloids rushed in to fill the gap. They exploded into a strange and diverse group. The earliest were the size of robins, but over millions of years, some grew as large as a twin-engine plane with a wingspan of almost 40 feet. They weighed from a few ounces to 200 pounds. Most lost their teeth, though some developed rows of bristles, perhaps for filtering food from the water. The newer model pterodactyloids shared longer heads crowned with magnificent crests that could be up to twice the size of their bodies. Their head bones had become very lightweight and their necks became bird-like, flexible and strong. Their tails shrunk to little stumps, no longer useful for flight. The loss of the long tail heralds an important change for the flying reptiles. Without it, they depended more on subtle wing adjustments to compensate for changes in air currents during flight, behavior that implies greater intelligence than the earlier ramphorhynchoids. Flying is perhaps the most strenuous evolutionary adaptation ever to arise. Scientists define two kinds of flying, soaring and flapping. Soaring flight, which depends on updrafts and breezes, requires less energy than active flapping. Like bats and birds, pterosaurs had skeletons which accommodated the large flight muscles controlling their oversized wings. Paleontologist Bob Baca believes their muscular development indicates pterodactyls were strong flyers. If you analyze pterodactyls in the front leg, in the back leg, in the torso, there's no animal that's ever evolved such a complete commitment to powered flight. Every, nearly every ounce of body muscle is tied to the flight muscles. These were exceptionally sophisticated, exceptionally strong flyers. It takes enormous energy and muscle strength for all that flapping. That requires a sophisticated metabolism, a warm-blooded metabolism. It also takes a nimble and sophisticated brain. Scientists believe pterosaurs had both. Pterosaurs' commitment to flight was capped by a lightweight but very strong skeleton.